Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Today we are continuing to explore in alphabetical order the Bali 9 and exploring Si Yi Chen. Si Yi Chen was born on the 19th of March 1985 in mainland China, the son of Edward Chen. At the age of 12 he and his family moved to Australia and he had to adapt quickly, learning English from scratch and to this day he continues to speak with a Chinese accent. As a result he became introverted and scared to talk as he was subjected to racism. His family settled down in Doonside, 40 kilometers west of Sydney. While he was subjected to a stereotypical Chinese style of love within his family, as an only child he was incredibly stubborn and had a huge ego and he began to rebel against his parents while in high school with his family embellic of a traditional Chinese family. He was unable to go to movies with friends or visit places like the theme park Wonderland Sydney in Eastern Creek which closed in 2004 during school holidays as he had to stay at home and study which led him to rebel against his family, particularly his dad. He refused his parents' wishes for him to undertake further study after high school and saw it as a waste of time and money, and he moved out of his home after high school and began crashing and living with friends. He told the ABC's foreign correspondent in 2017 that he was going to use the money paid from the drug trafficking operation, which according to Matthew Norman was $15,000, to go to aviation college. He had a grudge with his dad, and when he said he wanted to go to aviation college, his dad said, are you crazy? Where are we going to get that kind of money? And Chen became resolute to find the money himself. It is unclear how he became involved in the Bali 9 or drug dealing, but he acted on behalf of Mayo and Sukumaran as something of a wingman, including handing fellow Bali 9 member Rene Lawrence $500 in spending money at a Sydney hotel when Chen met on the 5th of April 2005 with fellow Bali 9 members Rene Lawrence, Mayo and Sukumaran, and Martin Stevens at a Sydney hotel. Stevens also claimed that during this meeting his life was threatened by Sukumaran. It was at this meeting that sealable plastic bags, medical tape, elastic waistbands and skin-tight bike shorts were stuffed into the bags of Stevens and Lawrence. On the 8th of April 2005, Chen arrived into Bali with Matthew Norman, the youngest member of the Bali Nine, and the pair checked into the White Rose Hotel, and it was reported that the pair barely left their hotel room. Now it is worth pointing out that the Nine really were playing Russian roulette with their lives and Australians knew the risks in drug smuggling and probably never more so than in 2005. Chappelle Corby was travelling from Sydney to Bali in 2004 and was arrested for smuggling 4.2 kilograms of cannabis inside her bodyboard bag into Bali and was facing a very realistic chance of a death penalty before being sentenced to 20 years in jail on the 27th of May 2005. Additionally, Van Tuong Nguyen, an Australian citizen from Melbourne, was facing the death penalty in Sydney for trafficking 369.2 grams of heroin from Cambodia and was arrested while in transit in Singapore on the way back to Australia. At the time he was on death row and was executed on the 2nd of December 2005. By the way, we did a video on the execution of Van Tuong Nguyen, so don't forget to check that video out. So at the time, you really could not watch a news bulletin, listen to a radio station, or read a newspaper without seeing or hearing something about the plight of drug trafficking and drug smuggling in Southeast Asia, so the Nine clearly knew the risks that they were taking in smuggling heroin out of Indonesia. A frantic Andrew Chan believed that they were being followed and delayed their departure from Bali and told everyone to change hotels. In reality, Chan did not know that Indonesian and Australian authorities were already onto the Nine. The father of Scott Rush, Lee Rush, contacted the Australian Federal Police, fearing that his son was travelling to Bali to commit a drug-related crime, and received assurance from the Australian Federal Police that his son was under surveillance and that they would dissuade him from going through with the crime and that he would not be able to board the flight. However, the Australian Federal Police never contacted Rush directly and instead alerted Indonesian police that a crime was going to be committed two weeks before the arrest, with the Australian Federal Police having launched an investigation approximately ten weeks before the arrests. So in essence, regardless of what Chan did, the operation was always going to be a bust. On the 14th of April, Chen and Norman, as well as Lawrence and Stevens, checked into the Adidama Hotel with fellow Bali Nine member Tan Duk Fan Nguyen checking into the 
Adidama Hotel two hours later, Chen and Nguyen took the same hotel room and Indonesian police checked into the room next to them. On the evening of Sunday the 17th of April 2005, Chen, Nguyen and Norman checked into the Milasti Hotel in Kuda. Sukumaran was with them and left his bags with the free before proceeding to the Hard Rock Complex and then returned to the Milasti Hotel. 20 minutes after checking in on the 17th of April 2005, police stormed the Melasti Hotel and Chen, Nguyen, Norman, all of whom are pictured with Chen in the middle and eventually Sukumaran, were arrested with 334 grams of heroin, bundles of plastic wrapping, elastoplast tape and scales indicating that they planned to traffic for heroin to Australia. Earlier that day at Nugara Rai International Airport in Denpasar, drug smugglers Martin Stevens carrying 3.3 kilograms of heroin, Renee Lawrence carrying 2.689 kilograms of heroin, Michael Shuzhukaj carrying 1.75 kilograms of heroin, and Scott Rush carrying 1.3 kilograms of heroin with all of the heroin body packed were arrested while Andrew Chan was arrested on board an Australian Airlines flight due to depart from Denpasar to Sydney. Chan had three mobile phones and a boarding pass to Sydney on him but no drugs on him. Sukumaran must have known what had gone down, leading him to remove the remaining drug traffickers to the Malasti Hotel the night that the other five were arrested, but with police staying in the room next door to Norman and Chen, there was nothing they could do. Chen's family had no idea what was happening and didn't even know that he was overseas, with his father reporting him missing to the Australian police, stating upon Chen's arrest, I didn't see him for two weeks. I never knew he was overseas. I am very surprised to hear this news. Chen's trial took place at the Denpasar District Court, commencing on the 11th of October 2005, and he was charged with Nguyen and Norman, the three arrested at the Melasti Hotel, which led to the nickname the Melasti Free. Throughout the trial, Chen denied any involvement in trafficking drugs into Australia, but was quiet and virtually inaudible to the judges. It is worth noting that at the time, Australian media, in the words of Bali Nine member Scott Rush in an interview with the SBS television show Dateline, was pretty racist and hence, while the media took a strong interest in young Anglo-Saxon white Australian Scott Rush and Matthew Norman, there wasn't as much interest in Asian Australian Si Yi Chen. As December 2005 rolled along, tensions between the Bali Nine and Sukumaran and Chan increased. Lawyers acting for the Bali Nine sought the support of the Director of Public Prosecutions to intervene and lay charges for conspiracy to import drugs into Australia so that the Nine could be extradited and charged under Australian law, but this did not come to fruition. During the pre-sentencing proceedings, Chen's father, Edward Chen, stated, if he has a chance to be saved, the judges could give him a light sentence and a chance to do good things. I don't think he's guilty. During his final plea on the 2nd of February 2006, Chen stated, I believe I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. My intention was to come to Bali for a holiday. I appeal to you to be merciful and give me a more lenient sentence. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison away from my family and friends for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, this fell on deaf ears and Chen was sentenced to life in prison. Chen appealed his sentence on the 6th of September 2006 in the Indonesian Supreme Court and he was sentenced to death along with Nguyen and Norman. He then confessed to his involvement during a further appeal in 2008 and on the 6th of March 2008 he and the rest of the Elasti Free had their sentences of life imprisonment reinstated. Chen remains in prison at Kerbakan Prison and works with a local jewellery company called Yin Jewellery and established Mule Jewels, a rehabilitative jewellery silver making program that offers inmates a trade skill in making jewellery which they can use upon their release. He also teaches English to other inmates and is active in religious activities. He has also become a Christian since his imprisonment and shares his cell with an unnamed Australian and Japanese individual. He regularly meditates and practices as Tai Chi, which gives him inner peace while in prison. He remains imprisoned with Norman and sees him as a younger brother. On the 28th of October 2020, Chen was one of three Australians along with paedophile Robert Andrew Fides Ellis and Brendan Johnson, who was convicted of cocaine possession, to develop coronavirus while in Kerbakan prison. He was briefly held in an isolation unit and made a full recovery. In July 2020, he and Norman launched their ninth application for clemency, for their sentence to be reduced from life imprisonment to 20 years, which would mean that they would be free by 2025, however this was denied. In August 2021, Kerbakan 
Jail Governor, Fikri Jaya Sorebing, said that Norman and Chen were model prisoners and deserved remission, stating they have never violated the rules inside the jail and they actively manage the rehabilitation programs in jail. They have fulfilled all the requirements. If they don't deserve to get it, I would not have proposed it. In a 2017 interview with the ABC's foreign correspondent, Chen stated that he thought he was rehabilitated and was reformed as he was helping other people. Thank you for watching, please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to inform you of when new videos come out. Also why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment, it helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day and remember the truth is always more interesting than fiction.